Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. And we turn now in our study of the Odyssey to book 16, Father and Son. I mean, think about this for a second. This is the first of many what we will call recognition moments or scenes. Each time, we'll point out, there is some pain involved, either for Odysseus or for someone else or for both. In this case, we're going to have father and son weeping with each other as they're holding each other. Think about this. It's been 16 now books, 15 books to get to 16 where we know this moment is coming, and the poet has kind of really worked hard to prepare us for this, is it going to be anticlimactic? Or how will Homer the poet deal with this, right? Can you imagine 20 years Odysseus hasn't seen his boy, or 20 years that his son, of course, is probably more closer to, you know, the, the, from the second or third year of life, when finally the kid recognizes that he doesn't have his father with him, right? And then the transformations that will be significant from this moment on of both Odysseus as well as Telemachus. Now, um, really quickly, uh, at learnstrong.net in the AP folder, we'll review real fast the books 1 through 15 just to make sure that uh, we know where we are. In book 1, we have the invocation. Of course, Telemachus is given his you need to grow up at 341, uh, 340, 341 of, of book 1. We're going to come back to those lines. In book 2, um, he leaves to go off to find Nestor and find information. In book three, he finds Nestor and then goes on to uh, take a look and have conversations with Menelaus in book four. Book four, Telemachus will have those conversations and then at the very end of the book we have the suitors ready to lay waste and uh, um, kill him and Penelope worrying about him. That's the Telemachy of the first four books. Books uh, five, six, seven, and eight, Odysseus arriving at the island of the Phaeacians. Book five, leaving Calypso's Island, book six with Nausicaa, book seven in the Phaeacian court, and then finally in book eight, the Phaeacian games, and then of course Demodocus, the uh, great blind poet. In books nine, 10, 11, and 12, we have Odysseus telling his flashback story. Um, in book nine, we have of course the Lotus Eaters and Polyphemus. In book 10, we have the Lystragonians, and, the, and then finally on the island of Circe. In book 11, that really important book about journey to the house of the dead, where he meets Tiresias and others. And finally in book 12, coming back, to uh, Circe to, par to bury Elpinor, and then finally past the Sirens, eating the cattle of the sun god, getting shipwrecked by Zeus, who's mad, of course, about it, and washing up onto Calypso's island. Then in book 13, the Phaeacians will return Odysseus, and for that they will be punished, turn a boat turned into stone. Book 14, we have Odysseus with Eumaeus, the swineherd. We get that long story uh, about the made-up stories about uh, who, who this beggar is. Finally, in book 15, we have Telemachus um, with Menelaus and Helen and then leaving. And finally, he's on his way to Emuaeus' the swineherd's um, um, hut uh, when we began book 16. Now, again, the hope is that you're reading this stuff on your own and then using me to help you. The learning theory reminding you is that we're uh, wanting to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. We're doing that in our reading theory by answering the three guiding questions at level one. What does the text say at level two? Um, how can I, um, how can I uh, maybe try and find meaning in this text? Um, at 2A, themes, messages at 2B. We're concentrating on symbol and irony. We're going to see a lot of that here. Um, and then finally at level three, at 3A, we want to relate to other texts beginning with the Iliad. Um, think about this. We, uh, we'll start to make these comparisons. Book 16 of the Iliad is the really important book of of the Iliad because that's where Patroclus has his Aristia and ultimately will die. We're going to see more of this kind of thing, this movement towards uh, the Iliad. And so we're going to begin to pay more closer attention to this kind of mirroring action. Finally, in 3B, we'll ask, how can I relate to this uh, kind of material personally, right? Um, it is true that Book 16 does pick up with the action. We're going to get a sense of this way more. Let's do a real quick summary of Book 16 before we get to some important lines. Telemachus arrives and we've got dogs who immediately will know him. You remember these are the same dogs that were barking at Odysseus. Pay attention to that in your notes. The references to dogs throughout the rest of the Odyssey. Of course, we're going to see the most famous reference to a dog in Argus in the next book. We'll, we'll save you for that one. Um, and Eumaeus is going to, uh, Eumaeus is going to um, uh, tell, uh, is going to treat Telemachus right away. But Telemachus shows up. Eumaeus is going to treat him just like a father. Think about how hard this must be for Odysseus to watch another man kind of play that father figure role. Telemachus is important. Telemachus shows the old man beggar, obviously, his father Odysseus, respect, right? It had been a legitimate question for Odysseus, I'm sure, right? Will my son be a good young man or will he be like some of these suitors that we've been hearing about? Telemachus asks, who is this stranger? Eumaeus will say that, uh, you know, he's got a story. I'm going to put him in your hands. 
and, um, and, and, and he doesn't mention anything about the possible sightings that this old man has to say about, about Odysseus. We then have Odysseus as the beggar talking to Telemachus, and he asked him, "Why don't I mean you got bad suitors in your house? Why don't you and your brothers just jack them all?" And Telemachus will say, "Yeah, that's not the way it works. In our lineage, we have one son and only one son." And then we get kind of that family lineage going backwards uh, from Telemachus, Odysseus, his father, of course, Laertes, and then finally um, Arceus, and all of them only had the one son. Um, Telemachus will send Eumaeus to Penelope and say, uh, just tell her, you know, what's going on and then I'm back. But don't worry about telling Laertes. Let Penelope send a messenger to your grandpa. I want you to come back here. He, uh, Eumaeus will leave. Athena then will be seen. She is seen by Odysseus. She's also seen by the dogs, which is fascinating. I mean, if you ever seen that in movies where somebody has tremendous gifted gifts and powers and the, the animals kind of back up her like a guard dog or something, this is where it comes from here. The dogs know it's Athena, but they kind of, you know, gr uh, away freaked out. Athena will transform Odysseus. She will tell him at line 190, it's time, it's time to tell him. And she makes him younger, she makes him taller. And then, of course, we have that pivotal moment at line 212 when Odysseus comes in, in front of Telemachus. First, Telemachus assumes he's a god. Odysseus will say at line 212, I'm not a god, I'm your father. Note, it's ironic. No long stories here. Well, I mean, we've had those, right? But no long stories here. In fact, just the simple truth. And yet, what's the irony? Telemachus doesn't believe his, that it's his father. Later, Penelope will play the same game. Doesn't believe, right? Uh, he can tell these long stories and people believe, but he just comes right out and says, I'm your dad. He doesn't believe him. Odysseus and Telemachus, however, uh, finally come to realize, uh, Telemachus realizes it really is his father. Then we'll have some talking of strategy, how to jack the 118 men. We're given the actual count now in this book. There's 118 of these guys total. And Odysseus will say, we don't need anybody to help us because we have Athena and Zeus. And then we have Odysseus's instructions to Telemachus as it is the, the strategy. Three for your notes. One, he says, I want you to let me suffer ill treatment from the suitors. Talk to them and tell them they shouldn't. But other than that, don't step in. Their doom is set, he will say. Number two, secure their weapons. Go lock them away in a, uh, in a, just in a, uh, in a room somewhere in the palace. And if they ask why, say two things to lie. One, we're worried about the smoke hurting the weapons. And two, you might get drunk and kill each other with the weapons around. But he says, leave two swords, two spears, two bucklers. That's all they're going to need. Very simple ideas about how they're going to have to fight to kill all these uh, helpless guys, right? The defenseless guys. Number three, he says, don't tell anybody that I'm here. He says, let's spy on, on the men and the women. And it's interesting that line 344, Telemachus will say, I'm hardly um, a flighty, weak-willed boy these days, which will remind us that in book one, line 341, Athena said to Telemachus, it's time to grow up. And Telemachus will, in fact, check his dad and say, don't worry about spying on all the other men. Um, we can do that later. Spy on some of the women, and that's basically all we need to do. The next thing is back in the, in the palace um, uh, um, on Ithaca, we have a herald who came from the boat when Telemachus arrived, and we have Eumaeus who show up at the same time, and the herald will say out loud in front of everybody, Telemachus is home. Now the suitors are going to know. Eumaeus will whisper in Penelope's ear the instructions, especially about getting information to Laertes, and then he will go back to his pigs. The suitors then will have their exchange uh, movement, um, and this is some of the action involved. First, Eurymachus, one of the major bad guys, will send. He says, "We got to send somebody to tell to get our to kill our to get our um, our comrades who've been waiting to kill Telemachus in their boat back." And then you have um, in, in Infinianus who will say, "No, no, they're here right now. They just arrived." All of the suitors will go down to the harbor. All of them come back to the meeting ground. And Tenos will then say, it's time for us to kill Telemachus now. The people are beginning to grow against us. we got to do this now. And Phineas will be the one that actually says, let's ask the gods first. And if the gods say Telemachus should be killed, I'll be the one to do it. Penelope, told by the herald Medon that this has been going on, she comes in front of the suitors at line 840, and she will tell Antinous three times, you need to stop. Stop trying to think about killing my son. Eurymachus will lie and say, we would never hurt Penelope, uh, uh, we would never hurt Telemachus at all. And then uh, we're told Penelope goes, goes up and Athena puts her to sleep. Meanwhile, Eumaeus shows back up at the hut and uh, Odysseus is changed back to being an old man. Telemachus asks about the suitors and he smiles at Odysseus. 
when Eumaeus isn't watching. He smiles at Odysseus when he's told they came back, and obviously they were very frustrated because they didn't get what they set out to do, to kill Telemachus. And then together, for the first time, father and son together, under the same roof since Odysseus left 20 years earlier, we're told they all sleep. Now, I, I, I've said this in every one of these lectures with you, even in the Iliad, uh, all of these books deserve reading, especially reading out loud. But Book 16 is one of those books. I mean, I've had AP students that read this out loud with their pals, and they're like, this is a great, great book for reading out loud because of some of the action. Um, but unfortunately, I just don't have the time. Uh, by the way, we said the same thing about Book 16 with the death of Patroclus, right? Um, let's go to work with it. At the very beginning, as dawn came into the lodge, the king and Loretta Lanson set out breakfast. It's always about food, right? And we're told, now Telemachus. The howling dogs went nuzzling up around him, not a growl as he approached. From inside, Odysseus noticed the pack's quiet welcome, noticed the light tread of footsteps too, and turned to Eumaeus quickly and says, Here comes a friend of yours, I'd say. Someone you know at least, the pack's not barking, must be fawning around him. I can hear his footfall. The words were still on his lips when his own son stood in the doorway there. I mean, you can't overlook the dramatic quality of what we're messing with right here, right? It's like, whoa, there he is after 20 years. He's standing there. Of course, think about it. Odysseus' instincts would be to what? Jump up, right? And go run to him and say, oh, this is my boy. Can't do it, right? Because he's, uh, he's in disguise. The swineherd, Eumaeus, however, does jump up. Amazed. He drops the bowl with a clatter. He's been busy with mixing ready wine. Straight to the prince, he rushed, kissed his face, kissed his shining eyes, both hands. Treats him like a son. As the tears roll down his cheek. And then we get it. As a father. And we get this interesting epic simile. As a father brimming with love, welcomes home his darling's only son in a warm embrace. What pain he's born for him and him alone, home now in the tenth year from far abroad. So the loyal swineherd hugged the beaming prince. He clung for dear life, covering him with kisses. The word yes is used, like one escaped from death. Eumaeus wept, sobbed his words flew from his heart. You're home, Telemachus, sweet light of my eyes. I never thought I'd see you again once you shipped to Pylos. Quick, dear boy, come in. Let me look at you. Look to my heart's content under my own, on my own roof, the rover home at last. You rarely visit the farm and men these days, always keeping to the town as if you cheered, as if it cheered you to see them there, that infernal crowd of suitors. Have it your way, thoughtful Telemachus replied. Dear old man, it's all for you that I've come to see you for myself and learn the news. Whether mother still holds out in the halls or some other man has married her at last, he's obviously thinking about what Athena said to him. And Odysseus's bed, we're going to hear a lot about Odysseus's bed, culminating with book 23, uh, line 200. So put that one in your notes. We'll come back to it. I suppose it's lying empty, blanketed now with filthy cobwebs. Surely, uh, Eurymachus will remind. But Penelope's still waiting there in the halls, poor woman, suffering so her life in endless hardship, wasting away the nights, weeping after the days. And then all of a sudden, the old man, the beggar, Odysseus, he gets up to give his seat to obviously, you know, a man of much higher social rank. And Telemachus immediately shows respect and says, no, 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 sit down, I'll get another chair. They eat together, they eat bread and wine together, and then finally Telemachus asks at line 63, old friend, asking Eumaeus, where does this stranger come from? You know, like, where's he come from? Which is obviously the question, who is this, right? Eumaeus will say he's from Crete. Um, he says, I turn him over to you, I put him in your hands. By the way, you, you, you Eurymachus says nothing about, uh, Eumaeus says nothing about uh, the fact that this guy claims to have seen your dad. Uh, very quickly, Telemachus will say, you know, I, I, I can't take care of this guy back in my house because my house is overrun with all these suitors. He says, I'm young myself. I can hardly trust my hands to fight off any man who rises up against me. This will change by the end of this book, by the way, Telemachus already, right? She, he says, I'll give him a shirt. Uh, but I'm not going to let him join the suitors. That would be bad form. And then for the very first time at line 100, Odysseus will speak to his boy. And he will say, surely it's right for me to say a word at this point. My heart, by God, is torn to pieces hearing this both of you telling how these reckless suitors, there in your own house against your will, plot your ruin. A fine young prince like you. This is like Shakespeare, where two, a, a line can be spoken and two different understandings. The people there in the, in the story versus those of us who are audience members watching, right? In other words, we know that when Odysseus says, my heart by God is torn to pieces hearing this, it obviously has its second meaning, no question, right? He, asks, he says, why don't your brothers and you uh, take care of it? He says, sounding very much like Nestor at line 110, 
Would I were young as you to match my spirit now. If I were the son of great Odysseus or the king himself returned from all his roving, there's still room for hope. Then let some foreigner lop my head off if I fail to march right into Odysseus' royal hall and kill them all. So you can kind of see that already Odysseus is laying the groundwork, right? And Telemachus will respond by saying, yeah, here's the problem. Um, the line of our, of our descendants, I'm the only one. In other words, I gotta be careful because once I'm dead, Odysseus is lineage is over, right? And he says about his mother at line 140, she neither rejects a marriage she despises nor can she bear to bring the courting to an end. We said this about Penelope. She is also between Scylla and Charybdis. What does she do? To be a good wife, she waits for her husband. If her husband is in fact dead, she needs to marry so that her husband's stuff and her boy's stuff doesn't all get eaten up. What do you do, right? Uh, Telemachus will tell Eumaeus, go and tell um, Penelope what's going on, um, and uh, you know, and 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 off off he's going to go. Um, of course, he says, don't you don't need to worry about Laertes. Let Penelope deal with that. And this uh, leaves Telemachus and Odysseus there alone. Athena's going to call to him. Uh, to Odysseus, he comes outside, visible only to Odysseus and the dogs. Again, we said the dogs. Are, are, there's no barking, they're kind of cowering, they whimper and they cringe away. And then finally she says it at line 190, Now is the time. Now tell your son the truth. Hold nothing back so the two of you can plot the suitor's doom and then set out for town. I myself won't lag behind you long. I'm blazing for a battle, sounding very much like the Iliad, right? Athena strokes him with the golden wand. He's transformed. She makes him taller, younger, a man of twists and turns, right? You can obviously see this one. And his own son gazes at him, wonderstruck, assuming that he's a god. And finally, Odysseus will speak at line 210. This is powerful stuff. No, I'm not a god. The long enduring great Odysseus returned. Why confuse me with one who never dies? No, I'm your father. The Odysseus you wept for all your days. You bore a world of pain, the cruel abuse of men. Of course, Telemachus, in other words, also suffered. And with those words, we're told Odysseus kisses his son and tears stream down his face. Um, but still not convinced it was his father, we're told. Telemachus says, no, you're not Odysseus, not my father, just some spirit spellbinding me now. Notice the skepticism is very similar to Odysseus when he was having his exchange with Calypso. Impossible for a mortal to work such marvels. Um, and, and, but just now, he said, you were old and wrapped in rags. But now, look, you seem like a god who rules the skies up there. The transformation, in other words. Telemachus, Odysseus says, it's wrong to marvel carried away, 2.30. To see your father here before your eyes. And then he says, no other Odysseus will ever return to you. That man and I are one. This is a pivotal moment in the poem where all of the different Odysseuses finally come to one Odysseus. And here he is and he says, I'm this one. I am Odysseus. He says, the man, that man and I are one, the man you see. Here after many hard, hardships, endless wanderings, after 20 years I've come home to native ground at last. My changing so... Athena's work. Telemachus accepts it. They cry, their shrilling voices, and then listen to this simile some, it's a, or, or comparison. Not really a simile, but it's beautiful. They cried out, line 245, shrilling cries, pulsing sharper than birds of prey, eagles, vultures with hooked claws, when farmers plunder their nest of young, too young to fly. Both men so filled with compassion, eyes, screaming tears. Um, I'll sometimes ask my students, why do you think they're crying? I mean, wouldn't they be like jumping up and down? Well, they're crying obviously because all of the lost years, 20 years, Odysseus never got to be a father to Telemachus, and Telemachus never got to be a son. And there is obviously sadness about that. Telemachus asks the obvious question, how did you get here? Odysseus will tell the whole story, but he tells it very, very quickly. And very quickly, he wants to go straight to work. He says, I... I, I want to know about these suitors. Tell me about these suitors. We get numbers that lead to 118 total at, at line 280 or so. Um, and we'll have even uh, Femicus mentioned as the poet, the bard, the gifted bard. And we're going to come back to him as we started at our lectures at book 22, line 350. Um, Telemachus is the one that says, I think we need more men. It's Odysseus that says, what are you talking about more men? we got Athena and Zeus. And it's... Um, and, and, and Telemachus is like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And, and, and Odysseus says it at line 300. Hey, trust me, once the fighting starts, Zeus and Athena, they're going to be ready to go. Then we will have Odysseus right away giving orders and directions to his son. And he will say it, he will say it this way. Um, he says, oh, oh, I want to back up just to line 270. As soon as Odysseus is right, I mean, they haven't been together for 25 lines. I'll use poet, poetic language. 
And already Odysseus is ready to start his strategy. And Telemachus says at line 270, Father, he says, all my life I've heard of your great fame, a brave man in war and deep and a deep mind in counsel. But what you say dumbfounds me, staggers imagination. In other words, he's, he's like blown away. He's like, I've heard about my, my dad all my life. And here he is right in front of me. And, the, and, and he's ready to go to work, right? Odysseus now giving his instructions, uh, starting at line 300 or so. First of all, he says, you got to let me suffer. You can't step in when the suitors jack me. They're going to jack me. Try and tell them to stop, but it's fine. Two, round up the weapons, as we say. Why about why you're rounding up the weapons, as we've already said. And uh, make sure you leave out the two swords, the two spears, the two bucklers. In other words, it ain't going to take much weaponry to be able to jack defenseless men. They're going to be put in a daze, that is to say like drunk, by, uh, by the gods, especially Athena and Zeus. Finally, three, silence uh, uh, all completely about my return. Much has been pointed out about the fact that Odysseus is risking a lot here. He doesn't really know whether his boy is capable of this kind of thing. And so there's always that question about, um, are you capable of this? And at line 340, Telemachus will say this, Soon enough, Father, you'll sense the courage inside me. That I know. I'm hardly a flighty, weak-willed boy these days. That's at line 344. Again, this one takes us back to the fulfillment at book one, 341. The beauty of this poem, it comes full circle. When Athena told uh, uh, um, uh, Telemachus, it's time you grow up. And here it is, he says, but I think your last plan would gain us nothing. Reconsider, I urge you. In other words, the boy is willing to stand up to his father right away and say, I got a better idea, better plan. And Odysseus, father and son, we're told, working together, conspiring, right? And... Um, and we have then the, uh, you know, the beauty, if you, if you want to, the beauty of all of this, right? Um, we, we then next will have, back on Ithaca itself in the palace, we'll have the convergence of Eumaeus and the herald. And the herald will blurt out that Odysseus, that Telemachus is back. And, uh, and that will, of course, ruin some of the plans, right? Um, and now the suitors completely know. Um, Eumaeus will then step up, whisper in Penelope's ear, and then get on back to the pigs. The suitors were told at line 